Today, we're going to look at uh, just a little bit uh, dispensationally. I hope there'll be a challenge to you. I think sometimes as we advance in our understanding of rightly dividing, I think that what we do, we just uh, we keep wanting to go, but we have to always keep coming back to make sure that the new people and some others that are trying to figure it out, that kind of helps them, assist them uh, to be able to get on board and go with us. Amen? And I think that's very, very important. Title of my message this morning is The Believer's Super Glue. The Believer's Super Glue. I don't know if you've ever got super glue on your fingers or not, but if you ever do that, it's almost nil to impossible to get them undone. Do you know that? Uh, somebody uh, on our staff was telling me they were gluing something, and they did it on the counter. And once we know that, some of that super glue had gone down between the object and the counter. And when he went to pick up his object after it had been glued, he, he couldn't hardly get it off the counter because it was super glued. You've seen the commercials with the guy with the hat, super glue, okay? Well, I believe there are some truths that when the lights come on, they're like super glue. And they're that which holds us together and bonds us so that we don't become fragmented in our Christian walk. And uh, I know that uh, in my life, uh, when the lights come on and God speaks to you, uh, say, uh, salvation. Uh, I remember uh, how God was working on my heart one week. And just, I was getting under conviction and conviction, and it was getting heavier and heavier. And I, I remember uh, when I was saved. And after I was saved, uh, I still had the old nature, but I noticed something else was going on inside of me. And it was God's presence after I got saved. I put my faith in Christ, His work, and my life began to change because of that truth. And that was like super glue to me. <laughs> it helps keep me from fragmenting apart in life. And then I remember uh, when uh, God began to work in me to make me realize He could use somebody like me coming from the other side of the tracks back in those days, and I realized that God has chosen the foolish things of this world. And so I, I saw that he could use me at soul winning, and so began a trek at that time of telling people about Christ, and we saw a number of people get saved, and it was so exciting, and as I was reading the scriptures and, and understanding uh, the truth of the gospel and everything, to be able to share that with people. And then later on, uh, the truth began that I could not be an effective witness unless there were some things in my life that were cleaned out. And so the process began of dying to self, of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And as I put on the new man, you still have that old nature that wants to flare up from time to time. But that old man, uh, we begin to crucify him more and more so that Christ might live through us. Uh, I remember uh, when God, I believe, uh, wanted me to go into full-time service. He began to work in my heart. And that truth revolutionized my thinking in my heart. And I knew that I needed to uh, go to school and get some education. And uh, so I went to Tennessee Temple. And while I was there, I had the understanding of, of what English meant. <laughs> and I uh, had to take uh, six semesters of English while I was there. Man, that was tough. It was like a foreign language to me. And, uh, but, there, but we persevered. And uh, then when God uh, said, uh, I want you to start a, a church, uh, now he didn't speak to me audibly as I was reading the word of God. God used some verses in the scripture to convict me that, uh, Jim, you're not the one who starts or builds a church. I'm the one. And as I began to look at those verses, that gave me faith to be able to step out and say, this is what we're going to do. And then as you grow as a Christian, there are times that uh, a truth uh, solidifies in your mind. You say, ah, oh, I didn't see that before. And it really encourages you. I remember uh, seeing the sovereignty of God. And uh, my, my thinking just crumbled right before me because I began to realize how great God truly is. And it changed my life. And then later on, of course, 
as I got older, uh, I knew there was something there, but I couldn't put my hand on it. God opened up the scriptures about rightly dividing. And he began to open it up to me. And I began to realize that there are different dispensations. And as a result of that, back here in time past, God dealt with the nation of Israel. And as he dealt with the nation of Israel, uh, the only way a Gentile could uh, come to faith and believe in God and be saved was through the nation of Israel. Had to do what Israel did. But we know that Israel turned to idolatry. And Israel turned to uh, immorality and uh, greed and everything, rebellion, unbelief. And so God had to send some judgments into Israel's life, even in, into captivity. But God was still watching over them. And he would give them another chance and another chance till finally, in the Gospels, the Son of God came down to the earth and their Messiah. It had been prophesied back here and it was fulfilled here. His name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was on the earth and he was a prophesied, the anointed Christ. And they needed to believe in him. Of course, we know that during the Gospels, they didn't believe in him. They turned their back on him, the religious order, those in charge. And as a result of that, they nailed him to an old rugged cross and they killed their Messiah. But we know, thank God, that he rose from the grave. He's alive. And then he ascended on high. And he told his 12 the Spirit of God was coming down and he would empower you to go out now to the nation of Israel in that power and demonstrate and give them the kingdom offer. If they would believe, then God, one day they would be over here, they would be uh, in the kingdom, the promised kingdom. But we know that Israel said, no, we don't want anything to do with that. And so God, mankind didn't have a chance because Israel had to be saved first. And since Israel wasn't, a, wasn't saved, then there was no hope for mankind because mankind had to go through Israel. But God sets Israel aside and in mercy and grace, God had a secret plan, a secret purpose. And that purpose was to raise up another apostle, not of the 12, but another apostle. His name is Paul. And he raised Paul up, and he gave Paul a new message. Unlike the message back here, faith, yes, but back here they had to believe that he was the Christ, the Messiah. Over here, the new message is that Christ on the cross washed away all of our sins, and he was buried and rose again for our justification. And with this new message... Anybody could be saved. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. Nobody was favored. And so he has this gospel now that's being presented today. Now one day, we know this body of Christ, we're going up. And we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And when we do that, he resumes his dealings with the nation of Israel. Israel will have to go through the tribulation. And at the end of that tribulation... Jesus Christ will return to the earth and he will set up his kingdom. And so these truths, they dictate in a way the way that you think in the way that you believe and the way that you live. And there are some important truths that I want us to see this morning, if we could, very quickly. Acts chapter 20, verse 17, Paul is going to go to Ephesus. And from Miletus, he's... Uh, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, verse 24. But none of these things, Paul says, move me, neither I count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry, this new message, gospel of grace ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, there's always been grace but there's only one dispensation of grace. Paul mentions grace more than all the entire Bible in his 13 books, more than the rest of the entire Bible, because it's the dispensation of grace. Amen? And Paul was worried about false teachers coming in. He says this in verse 28 and following. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers or pastors to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God shed his blood. 
For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I wonder what Paul would do today. I'm sure he would weep if he would see Christendom the way that it is today. And now, brethren, I commend you to God, to the word, to the word of his grace, this dispensation of grace message, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified or set apart. So Paul, with a broken heart, warns the people at Ephesus. He knew that false teachers would come and try to destroy this message. And by the way, history proves that's exactly what happened. And not only that, after a period of time, there arose another group of people, not like the early church, and it sent them into the Dark Ages. And through the Dark Ages that came out of that, the Church of Rome came to power. And what they said went, if not, you were in trouble. We're told that there were 50 million martyrs for their faith in Jesus Christ by the Church of Rome. That's history. That's a truth. That's a fact. And so I'm saying to you today, there are some things we need to have so we won't be fragmented when false teachers or other people are trying to say other things to us. Notice what he says in verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. There we see our goal. Our goal is to strive to make our practice, our lifestyle, our behavior, our conduct, to bring it up to the position we have in Christ. We're Christ ones now. And we should be different than the world. We should be lights to the world. Not weird, but we should be lights to the world. That they know there's something inside of us that's different. And seeking this should be our priority. He states in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, If you then be risen with Christ, if you've been saved, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. In other words, he says, since you've been saved, now your priority ought to be on heavenly things, heavenly truths that will last for all eternity. Because the things of this world will not last forever. They will pass away one of these days. Amen? And then notice our heart in verse 2. With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That should be our heart. We should never forget where God found us when he saved us. Amen? We should, never re, uh, we should never forget our salvation, why we needed salvation. Dr. Gray wrote this one time. He said this, Naught have I gotten but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. In other words, our life, we're not to walk around here like proud peacocks. We're not to be arrogant or puffed up. If Jesus Christ, who thought it was not robbery to be equal with God because he is God, but he made himself of no reputation, but he, made, he came in the form of a servant. If Christ did that, how much more should we do that? And God says, listen, I want you to live your life. I want you to live humbly. I want you to love humbly. Because when you don't, and you say you're a believer, you turn people off. You hurt people. And you prevent God's message from being proclaimed. I've told this before, but I think it fits here, about a pastor debated a lady live on radio one time about Christianity and not believing. And he took his son with him. And during the debate, the pastor was very good. He was efficient. And he really put this lady down several times personally. 
And after it was all over with, the pastor said to his son, well, how do you think I did? And the son said, well, you won the debate, but you lost your soul. And there are some times the way we live and speak, we turn people off, we'll never get another hearing from them. And God says that's not the way it's supposed to be. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 said, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, he said, I am nothing. Now, I can know it all. And some people are proud that they think they know it all, and they don't. Huh? But if I don't have compassion for other people, it doesn't mean anything. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3 says this, With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. I'm in prison for this message. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And so Paul says, listen, when you're speaking, you don't speak in a condemning way to other individual people, that you're something special, you're superior, you're better than they are. No, you're not. You're just a sinner who's been saved by the wonderful grace of God. And don't ever forget that when you're speaking to other people. So Paul wanted that No, There are some people who claim they're saved. They claim they've received grace, but they hardly ever give any grace. And God says, I don't want you to believers to be that way. And then notice our fellowship or oneness in verse 3. Notice what he says. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. God hates certain things. God hates divisions, schisms, churches that have built up walls between believers. They constantly debate, fight, put down, gossip, name call. They threaten, they accuse. They tear apart by discord. And God hates that. And I say to you, there are some even grace believers that are arrogant. They think they know it all, so they think they have the authority to condemn everyone who doesn't line up with their doctrine. They're good at that. Paul says, I hate that. 1 Corinthians 3, 3 says this here, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envyings and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You walk as men, you walk like lost people. You're supposed to be different than them. Amen? That's what lost people do. We're not supposed to do that. Paul says, here's how I want you to live, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, now, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. Philippians 1.27 says this here, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and, and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. God says you can't go forward promoting this wonderful mystery grace gospel unless you're unified. And there needs to have that kind of spirit. That's why my life verse is, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We have to be forgiving individual people. Amen? So bitterness doesn't get in. You know, you can have a list of ten things, and you might disagree a little bit about one thing, and they denounce you. Have anybody... Has anybody found that out to be true yet? I know I have. You know, you can believe about Paul rightly dividing and all these things, but you're not sure you disagree about are the 12 apostles, are they in the body of Christ or out of the body of Christ? And that debate goes on all the time. 
And so we have those that say, well, we're in the body of Christ. They're in the body of Christ. We have those that say, they're not in the body of Christ. <laughs> and they fight like dogs. Don't become a part of anything like that. And by the way, the way I believe is the right way. <laughs> I believe all of us, Old Testament, New Testament, we're all in Christ redemptively. But in Christ, you have the house of Israel and you have the body of Christ and they are separate from one another. You'll figure that out one of these days, I'm sure. But if you don't, you know what? We still love you in Christ, amen? And then notice our truths. Here's the super glue. Here's the truths that you should get a hold of, okay? Notice in verse 4, he says this here. There is one body. Now, by the way, that was secret. Nobody knew about the body of Christ right here. Nobody knew about this. And so Paul says there's one body. And what that means is when you believed in the gospel, he took you out of Adam and he placed you into Christ. Into a spiritual union, a spiritual relationship with the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Christ took you out of the first Adam and he placed you into the second Adam. That's your identity now. You are in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being now are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized, not water, spirit, baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles or whatever it might be. Verse 14 says this, For the body is not one member, but many. And then verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So there is one body of Christ. Anybody in this world who puts their faith in the gospel are spiritually placed into that body by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? And that body was a secret. It was hidden. It was a mystery. It's a new creation. Where Jew or Gentile, they are one in Christ. Over here, we are the one new man. That was the secret. That was a mystery. God kept hidden. Everybody had to go through Israel here, but now everybody goes through the gospel. Amen? Amen? Secondly, notice verse 4. And one spirit. Now that one spirit is God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when you believe the gospel, he seals us, enlightens us, instructs, convicts, comforts, guides, strengthens, walks with us, works in us to bear godly fruit, fights for us against our old nature, and he indwells us. This was all new. Only Paul could teach this truth. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, faith comes by hearing, of the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen? Romans 8.9 says this here, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, if you are saved, you have the Spirit of God. If you're not saved, you don't have the Spirit of God. Verse 14, he says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You ever sense the Spirit of God working in you and through the Word of God to lead you, to guide you? Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Galatians 5, 16. I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's our secret to victory right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. 
but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 12 and following. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, if you're saved today, the Spirit of God, this one Spirit, He placed you into Christ, and He placed Himself into you. Amen? And it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Then notice the next thing there in verse 4. One hope. Now remember before Paul, we were aliens from the life of God. We had no hope. We had no covenants. And the fact that we have hope today is an act of God's grace given us. Now the word hope doesn't mean, well, I hope so. The word hope in the Greek means confidence, assurance. I know it's going to take place. That's the kind of hope he's speaking about. And as Israel had an earthly hope, the thousand-year kingdom, we have a heavenly hope. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together where? In heavenly places. And by the way, this hope is not just for the future one day in that sense of eternity, but also the next great event that's going to take place, and it's the rapture. Do you know, prior to Paul, nobody knew about the rapture, the departure of the body of Christ from this earth. It was a secret. It was a mystery. And he tells us something that's wonderful. All the Jews knew they have to go through the tribulation, but the body of Christ does not have to. He states this in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We don't have to experience the wrath of God when God pours it out upon this earth. Chapter 5, verse 9 says this, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the word salvation there also is deliverance. He's going to deliver us so we don't experience the wrath of God on this earth. That's why Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. As I said before, we're looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. Amen? Amen. And we're going up one of these days. Notice then in verse 5. Verse 5. Notice what he says. One Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, and 6, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one Lord, Jesus Christ. He's the only true Lord there is. He's the master, he's the head, he's the God, he's the Savior. Philippians 2.10 tells us this here, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Jesus Christ is the only Lord, the only Savior that there is. And he's seated on the right hand of the Father. Why is he sitting down? Because the Father accepted his work. Amen? And then notice verse 5. I'm trying to hurry. One faith. One faith. It's one act of our faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he died for us, was buried, and rose again. And that is the full meaning of the cross. Back here, they didn't have the full meaning of the cross. They just knew their Messiah had been crucified, and then God raised him up. 
But over here, Paul tells us what the cross, his shed blood, his death, his resurrection had accomplished. And that's why we say we're saved by grace today. Huh? Because of the accomplishment of the cross. And well, to praise God for that. Amen? Now, America prides herself in being a melting pot of all faiths. And especially these last years. And I say to you, by recognizing all these other faiths, they're given equality to these false religions. And that is a sin. There's only one true God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And the Father, he himself, there is one faith today, and only one that he recognizes, and it's the faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one way to get there, and that's through Jesus Christ. The Bible is not something you go to and look at 15 different ways and say, well, we're all going to end up in the same place because we all worship the same God. Hogwash. Allah is not God. Buddha is not God. Jesus Christ is the true God. Then notice what he mentions, one baptism. This baptism is the baptism that saves and counts for all eternity. It's spirit baptism that places us into a spiritual union in Christ, into his spiritual body. This identifies us with Christ, his death, his burial, and resurrection. Colossians 2.10 says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality, and whom also ye are circumcised, now get this, not physical, with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins, and so on. God spiritually circumcised our heart, cut it off from the old man. The next verse, if you guys could throw it up there. And then I missed a verse. Which verse did I miss? That we were baptized by the operation of God. It is a, not water, it is a spiritual baptism that takes place in our life. Now, it's at this point, and I'll make this my last point. got all kinds. I got in the spirit when I put this together, evidently, amen. <laughs> it's at this point Christianity's unity is broken. Water baptism has divided so many believers to the point of starting new denominations. They fight and argue over the mode, the candidate, the authority of who does the baptizing, is it by immersion, sprinkling, or pouring? Is it for the remission of sins to become a member of the church? Is it an infant, a child, or an adult? Who baptizes? A priest? A preacher? Any layman? What formula is to be used? What words are to be said in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? I told you about the guy that wanted me to baptize him. He said, now, when you baptize me in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. I said, okay. And he was serious. He said, listen. He tapped me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I said, okay. So it's time we started walking up the steps and he tapped me on the shoulder again. He said, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, this guy's dead serious. I said, okay. So I got up to the baptistry, started to go down there, and some people had put rubber ducks, and they were all floating in the water. <laughs> now I have this serious guy behind me. It's a holy time for him. Those were in the old days. Or is in Acts 2, baptized in Jesus' name only. 
Some baptize in the triune God, and they immerse one for each name. Name of the Father, name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. Amazing. And as a result of that, it just leads to confusion. Some denominations, they baptize infants. Another one sprinkled children and adults and says that it removes original sin. Another one says, well, when you repent and have faith and are water baptized, then your sins are forgiven. Another one says this, bless this water and give it grace of redemption. Another one says this, spirit, the spirit within you that be born of water through baptism, and then you're incorporated into Christ's priesthood. Reformed church says, it assures us of the washing away of sin and new life in Christ. The Lutheran, one of their, their groups, says this, in holy baptism, it liberates us from sin. In the holy waters, we are reborn children of God. The Baptists say this, and that's what I was. It doesn't save, but you can't be a member or ever serve until you're obedient to baptism. But they say it's a public testimony. And let me just say this to you, chapter and verse. Uh, what's so big about that one time? It's a testimony. Listen, live your life, that's your testimony. Amen? Amen? And so there are so many differences. Les said this. He said when he asked Baptist, and that's what I was, Baptist, he said when I asked him, I said, are you saved? What's the first thing they usually say? I've been baptized. And it's become such an icon. If you don't think it is, you take it away from them. And they would rather fight you for that than the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm preaching good, Jim. I just... Uh, uh, that's right. Amen. Rightly dividing dispensationally. As long as God dealt with Israel, the sign people, they water baptized and were spirit-empowered. But when Israel rejected the 12 apostles' kingdom offer in Acts 7, finally, God began setting Israel aside. Even though Paul said in Acts 9, this here, the, the decision, it's done, but the transition, there's a transition here from Israel to the body of Christ in understanding in Revelation that Paul receives from Christ, there's a transition there to the end of Acts 28. I think that's important that I mention that. God then in Acts 9 raised up a new apostle, giving him a new revelational gospel grace message, calling out a new man, a new people, the mystery body of Christ. Acts 9 through 28 was transitional from Israel, the prophetic program, from the temple, from circumcision, from the law, from baptism, from works, to faith alone and the gospel alone in the body of Christ. From that. And God progressively revealed this new truth to the Apostle Paul. Now at the beginning of Paul's ministry, Paul did many Jewish practices. At the beginning, he did these things in order to win some of the individual Jews and to respect them and not offend them. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew. Why? That I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, he said, I placed myself under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So Paul did some Jewish things at his beginning. Paul took Jewish vows. He offered sacrifices. He spoke in tongues. He did healings. He performed the miraculous. He followed the law when he was with them. And he water baptized. But by the end, I'm about done, but by the end of Acts 28, Israel was completely set aside. Paul says, I go to the Gentiles 
the transition was over. Paul, having received more revelation from God, water baptism, as well as the healings, the tongues, the Jewish things, were no longer necessary. This Jewish rite of water baptism, that they might become a kingdom of priests, when they were set aside, so was the practice of that. Now for the body of Christ today, it's only one baptism. Amen? And that is spirit baptism. And it happens automatically to you the moment you put your faith in Christ. Do you know that Paul never in 13 books ever commands us to be water baptized? And it's Paul's 13 epistles that describe the instructions for the body of Christ that's for today. And the great confusion is we keep taking Israel's truths and bringing them over into body truths. And that's what continues to happen over and over. But remember, Paul is our apostle. We love the 12, but they're not our apostles. They ministered to the nation of Israel. Paul, Romans eleven thirteen, 13, is our apostle. And we follow his instructions. And Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but the, you know the Jews, the 12 could never say that. The 12 could never say that because that was part. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. It was necessary for the Jews. But Paul says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Today, if you guys could find for me Galatians 3.28, just find that verse for me. And today it's completely wonderful. There is neither Jew nor Greek There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, back here they were favored. Here the Jews are not favored. Nobody's favored today. Except all of mankind that has the opportunity to be able to believe in the gospel. That's for us today. And I close with this here. And there is one God and Father of all. Not everybody has him as their father. A lot of people believe in the fatherhood of God, that we're all children, and that's not true. Remember he said to the religious leaders and some others, he said, you are of your father the devil. Huh? You remember that? You can only call him the father is if you're a believer in Christ. That's when he becomes your father. And it's then, He's not some far-off deity that never listens to us. He's a father who loves us, who cares for us, who hears us, wants to help us, who guides us, who preserves us, who provides for us, and he's real. That's the kind of father that we have in this dispensation of grace. Never has it been so good like we have it today. And when that truth comes to your mind, It revolutionizes your thinking, the way you believe, and the way you look at scriptures. Amen? It's like the lights come on. I was reading about a priest, and he was in a confessional booth. And this is true. Uh, His name is Franco Magito, something like that. And Franco, he was in a confessional booth, and in his mind, something began to roll over. He says, why do you keep having people bring their sins to you? Jesus has died for sins. You need to believe in him and praise him. Now, this is a priest. He knew something was wrong in his heart and his life. He knew something was wrong. He was empty. And it was during a mass, while he was praying, there was a young boy, he was there, he heard him. And he said to himself, God, what's wrong with me? And God kept bringing back to his mind Hebrews that says this, 
sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then he, saw, he said another, uh, at that same time, another verse, and every priest standeth daily ministering, oftentimes, the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Franco said, he, his own testimony, he said he turned around to the people and he said, to the, did you hear that? Did you hear God speak? And then he started crying. He started laughing. He said, today I just got sacked. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, I've been sacked once forever. He did the job. The lights came on and he was wonderfully saved. And he goes around telling everybody how to be saved today properly. Isn't that amazing? And when the lights come on, transform, transformation takes place. And when this truth here, you begin to figure this out and it comes on to you, it's like that light and it's such revelational. It's such, what? Wonderful. That you see the truth and you know the truth and as you take these ones and you put them together, it makes you a solid Christian so that when the wolves come your way, you'll not be fragmented or give them an open door, but you'll be a solid ground, you know, foundational believing Christian. And you'll not be wavered, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Amen? I'm just going to close this off and just have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for rightly dividing. And God, it's our responsibility every now and then just to remind ourselves so that we get a hold of it. That we also, as we learn it, we don't take it for granted. It's such a wonderful truth. It's liberating. It gives freedom. It gives grace. That we're not bound by all the rules and regulations and all these things that placing ourselves under law had affected us in our denomination or in our church previously. Now we have freedom in Christ. We have liberty in Christ. But also, Lord, we have love. And it's that love that causes us to want to live godly, to want to please you, to want to do our best for you. Not because we have to, somebody's beating us over the head, but because we love you for who you are and what you did, you interrupted history just for us. May we get a grasp of it. In Jesus' name. Everybody we said? hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you is our prayer.